While Japan faces its fair share of economic issues, like any other country, today, Japan is the third largest economy on the planet by nominal GDP. Japanese electronics are famous the world over, and Japanese people are constantly pushing the boundaries of technology. However, this is not always the case. Until the latter half of the 19th century, Japan was an isolated archipelago that was far behind European nations in terms of technology and economic growth. In 1853, when Commodore Matthew Perry used gunship diplomacy to force Japan's borders open, the reigning Tokugawa regime lost all legitimacy and was quickly replaced by the Emperor Meiji, ushering in a period of unparalleled modernization. The normal story we hear about the Meiji period is marked by enlightened despotism. The benevolent Meiji modernized the country by importing Western technology and human capital. But this is only half of the story. Japan did not only import Western technology, but Western ideas. However, this aspect of the Meiji Restoration was not a top-down approach, but a popular movement galvanized by an awareness of political rights, representation, and democracy. Though known to few Westerners, the soldier, politician, and popular leader, Itagaki Tasuke, brought classical liberal principles to the forefront of the Japanese world. Though we are talking about the Meiji period, we need some context of what Japan looked like before its rapid industrialization. In the 15th century, the ruling Ashikaga shogunate collapsed, leaving a power vacuum for various warlords to try and fill. But despite their lofty ambitions, no one could reunify Japan under one banner. For nearly 150 years, Japan was plunged into perpetual civil war known as Sengoku. Eventually, the warlord Tokugawa Ieyasu displaced his rival Totomi Hideyoshi's son and finally unified Japan under what is known as the Tokugawa Shogunate. The iconic samurai warriors who had made a name for themselves in Japan, engulfed by war, now found themselves in an awkward position. In a world without constant bloodshed, warriors were no longer needed. The samurai adapted under the Tokugawa Shogunate. They became scholars and bureaucrats for the government, living off a stipend supplied to them by the state. Previously, trade was largely left unrestricted, but under Tokugawa's rule, a strict policy of isolationism was followed called Sakoku. Any foreigner who entered, or Japanese national who left the country, was to be executed. Though foreign trade was permitted to some small degree, it was heavily regulated and limited in scope. For all intents and purposes, Japan was a closed country, a mysterious place most of the world knew little about. Tokugawa's policy of isolationism lasted over 200 years, during which Japan experienced internal peace and harmony. After so much war, the Tokugawa regime pursued peace and harmony above all else. The state enforced strict laws based upon hierarchy and tradition. Penalties were harsh to stop any sort of dissent. While there were undoubtedly technological and intellectual developments during this period, Japan was outpaced by European nations who were constantly trying to outcompete one another. While European nations were groping towards modernity, Japan stayed firmly in place. This was the culture Itagaki Tasuke was born into. But by the end of his life in 1919, Japan was transformed dramatically into the most powerful nation in East Asia. Itagaki Tasuke was born in 1837 and he belonged to a middle-ranking samurai family based in the Tosa Domain on the island of Shikoku, the smallest of Japan's four main islands. Itagaki spent his youth being educated in traditional mores and manners of a samurai, studying philosophy, poetry, the tenets of Shinto Buddhism, on top of training in martial arts and military strategy. His home, the Tosa Domain, was an unassuming location for a political leader who had come to define a generation. However, Tosa's location on the Pacific Ocean made an ideal place for international trade. Still, due to the Tokugawa regime's strict isolationist policy, the Tosa Domain did not become the powerhouse of shipping and industry it ought to be. But the situation of Tosa changed dramatically while Itagaki was still young. This change did not come from government decrees or the wisdom of a samurai class, but from the efforts of a commoner teenage boy. Manjiro was a common-born fisherman who lived in Tosa, in the village of Nakohama. At the age of 14, while he was out fishing, Manjiro's boat was wrecked on the island of Torishima. Manjiro and his four friends survived by scavenging food until they were encountered by an American whale ship, captained by William H. Whitfield. Whitfield took aboard the five survivors and left them in Honolulu, Hawaii. However, Manjiro wanted to stay aboard the ship. Whitfield brought Manjiro back to Fairhaven, Massachusetts, where he was enrolled in school studying English and navigation for a year. Following this, Manjiro apprenticed as a cooper until he found employment on a whaling ship. After two years of whaling, Manjiro returned to Massachusetts with $350 to his name. Manjiro used his money to travel to California to take part in the gold rush, 
But unlike so many others, Manjiro actually struck gold and earned an additional $600. With his small fortune, Manjiro bought a whaleboat which he used to return to Japan. When he reached Okinawa, he was quickly arrested for leaving the country. Government officials interviewed him extensively, asking about the far-off land of America. When he was eventually released, Manjiro was awarded a position as a minor official. This was because Manjiro knew more about America than any Japanese person alive. Manjiro was probably the first Japanese person to take a train, ride in a steamship, officer an American vessel, and command a trans-Pacific voyage. When Manjiro was summoned to Tokyo to answer questions about the outside world, he was made into a samurai. Returning to Tosa, Manjiro urged Tosa officials to engage in foreign trade, knowing firsthand how superior Western technology was compared to technology in Japan, reminiscent of a bygone feudal era by European standards. Thanks to Manjiro's advice, Tosa grew rapidly, becoming a prosperous domain. Increased trade helped Tosa grow economically, but it started to upset the centuries-old hierarchy of Japan. Though a commoner by birth, people such as Yataro Iwasaki started investing money into shipping, founding his own company. You might have heard of it. Mitsubishi. Yataro used his money to buy a rank of samurai. People like Yataro and Manjiro proved that anyone, samurai or peasant, had unlimited potential when given the chance. Importantly, Manjiro also introduced Western ideas, translating authors like John Stuart Mill, Herbert Spencer and Jean-Jacques Rousseau to Japanese. Manjiro was the leading authority in the nation on all things Western, and taught and educated future liberals like Itagaki on Western ideas of constitutional government and democracy. By the age of 18, Itagaki was sent by his local lord, or Daimo, to study at Edo. Upon returning, Itagaki was quickly exiled for criticizing Tosa officials he disagreed with. While in exile, he spent his time studying and hunting until he was recalled to Tosa again to take charge of a team of tax collectors. Itagaki questioned the legitimacy of the highly centralized Tokugawa regime. He believed in local autonomy and public participation in politics, something that was completely alien to Japan, which was run by a small cadre of elite scholars and samurai. Though the Tokugawa shogunate had reigned for over 200 years, the regime was thrown into question with the arrival of four American steamships. In 1852, the American Commodore Matthew Perry, not the actor from Friends, the captain of a ship, was given a mission by President Millard Fillmore, forced the Japanese to open their ports to American trade by using whatever means necessary. American whalers needed coal to power their steamships, and European monopolies meant Americans needed to find an alternative source of coal, and Japan was ripe for the taking. By 1853, Perry reached the city of Uraga at Edo Bay. The port of Nagasaki was the only Japanese port that was open to foreigners, but Perry ignored this and sailed straight towards the capital of Edo. As a show of military might, Perry ordered his crew to fire the cannons 73 times, supposedly as a celebration of Independence Day, but in reality, Perry was showing off superior American technology. Perry eventually met with Japanese officials, handing over a letter from President Fillmore, promising to return for a reply. At a time when decisive leadership was needed desperately, the Japanese head of state, the shogun Tokugawa Iyoshi, died, leaving the administration in the hands of a council of elders. Unsure of how to proceed, the Japanese negotiators floundered, causing Perry to lose his patience. He threatened to bring a hundred more ships in 20 days unless his demands were met. The Japanese had never seen such formidable cannons or ships with explosive shells, and it was obvious that war, even against a fraction of the American military might, would be a death sentence. Perry's demands were met. Ports were open to foreign trade, and American citizens could live and trade at certain ports. Other nations quickly followed suit, and by 1858, the Dutch, French, Russians, and British secured commercial treaties. Now in his 20s, Itagaki began to doubt the efficacy of the government run by high-ranking samurai. Fearing for Japan, Itagaki started to indulge in anti-Westerner views. In the face of an external crisis, the Tokugawa regime flinched and agreed to wholly unequal treaties that were considered highly humiliating. Samurai began to lose faith in the shogun. Western nations were ever expanding into new colonial territories, and it seemed like Japan was on its way to becoming a colony for whatever Western nation prevailed. Anti-Western sentiment and international humiliation fueled movements that called for the overthrow of the shogun. Japan had always had an emperor, but this position was largely ceremonial without any real power. The real power lay in the hands of the shogun, the de facto military dictator who ruled Japan. By 1867, samurai mainly from Chosu, Satsuma, and Tosa domains united secretly to overthrow the shogun or replace him with the emperor, who vowed to expel the western barbarians from the country. 
Isagaki was one of the highest ranking officials in Tosa, and he secretly purchased 300 US made rifles and armed his followers. In 1868, shogunate forces marched on Kyoto to deliver a letter to the emperor, warning him to cease his bid for power. Pro emperor forces met the shogun army at Fushimi near Kyoto, and the war began. After four days of fighting, despite outnumbering the pro emperor forces three to one, the shogun's forces were soundly defeated, thanks to the pro emperor's side having superior western firepower, including howitzers and mini rifles. Itagaki became a war hero during the Boshun War, when his forces soundly defeated the Aizu clan in northern Japan. By June of 1869, the fighting was over. The rebels had overthrown the shogun, and the now deceased emperor was succeeded by his son Meiji, who started the aptly named Meiji Restoration, a period during which Japan rapidly modernized to catch up Western powers they feared so greatly. Emperor Meiji, though, quickly abandoned his father's promise to expel the barbarians, realizing that coexistence with the West was the only real option for Japan. During the Boshin War, the former emperor promulgated something called the Charter Oath, a document that outlined the main aims of the emperor's new regime. There were five clauses. The first, establish deliberative assemblies guided by open discussion. The second, unite all classes in carrying out the administration of the state. Third, that commoners could pursue whatever profession they preferred and move around the country at will. Fourth, that evil customs of the past were to be abandoned. And lastly, that knowledge was to be sought wherever it came from to strengthen Japan. The charter was certainly a step in the right direction. However, it was very vague it answered some questions, but raised even more. By now, Itagaki was a decorated war hero and was appointed as a cabinet consultant. By 1870, he was promoted even higher to the rank of Councillor of State. In 1873, Korea had refused to recognize Japan's sovereignty, still recognized it as a sort of vassal to the Chinese state, so they refused to receive the Japanese envoys. At the same time, disaffected samurai were quickly losing their state-funded privileges, and they needed a source of income. Many samurai believed an expedition could help restore the samurai to their rightful place as the hereditary caretakers of Japan, a notion that Emperor Meiji had begun to act against by abolishing their privileges. The emperor had gradually lowered samurai stipends, leading to widespread poverty amongst the formerly powerful samurai class. Itagaki, alongside a fellow Boshin war hero, Saigo Takamori, supported the war. Itagaki also believed that an invasion of Korea would be a chance to establish Japan as an empire in the world. This undoubtedly blots Itagaki's future liberal credentials. However, context is necessary. The geopolitical dynamics of the time for East Asian countries were quite simple. Become a colony or start your own. People such as Itagaki and Saigo decided they would rather be conquerors than conquered. But when the majority of the government refused to declare war, Itagaki, Saigo and others resigned. Though Itagaki's reasoning for resigning was not solely due to the refusal of the expedition. He had observed that the prominent supporters of the emperor during the war were awarded all the government positions lean to the domination of the Satsuma and Chosu clans. Itagaki opposed the Tokugawa government because it monopolized positions of power within a small clique. He saw the exact same thing happening again in the Meiji regime, and thus resigned in protest. Returning to his native Tosa, Itagaki was appointed the position of chief executive officer of the region. He focuses energies mainly on modernizing efforts, reducing restrictions on private businesses, lowering taxes, and making it easier to obtain permits for trade and shipping. But Itagaki had an ambitious vision for Japan beyond Tosa. He believed that the main issue facing Japan was that the government officials acted on their own will. The law was interpreted loosely and constantly changed and bent to suit those in power. There was little, if any, accountability, and the vast majority of the public had no real voice to air their grievances. So alongside eight other disaffected samurai, Itagaki submitted the memorial on the establishment of a representative assembly a document where Itagaki and his cohorts demanded the government immediately establish a popularly elected assembly that was subject to the will of the people. He explained that in the current administration, decrees of the government appear in the morning and are changed by the evening. The law was inconsistent and constantly changing. Furthermore, Itagaki explained that the application of the law is influenced by private considerations of rewards and punishments, wholly depending on the personal favour or disfavour of officials. He explained that, the channel by which the people should communicate with the government is blocked, and they cannot state their grievances, leading to a cycle of poor government. Itagaki demanded that Japan adopted a more Western style of government that respected public discussion of issues and constitutional limits on power to ensure the universal rights of all people. Preempting anti Western feelings over adopting a foreign style of government, Itagaki responded by saying that foreigners discovered how to establish better governments through actual experience, and that if people were against foreign styles of government because they were not Japanese, it would be like if Japanese people wouldn't use steam engines until they discover the principles and mechanics on their own. 
Beyond discussing how the government ought to be structured, Itagaki also invoked the importance of natural rights and liberty, writing that liberty is an assumption that requires no defence, and not that a declaration of independence is claim that people's inalienable rights are self-evident. Following his memorial in 1875, Itagaki established the Party of Public Patriots, a name specifically chosen to avoid the strict censorship laws of the time. Itagaki aimed to use this organization to push for a direct government election of officials. The party declared that we 30 millions of people in Japan are all equally endowed with certain definite rights, among which are those enjoying and defending life and liberty and acquiring and possessing property, and obtaining a livelihood and pursuing happiness. These rights are by nature bestowed upon all men and therefore cannot be taken away by the power of any man. Itagaki was a staunch admirer of the American and French revolutions, so it's no surprise he included the Lockean trio of rights, life, liberty, and property, alongside the distinctly American pursuit of happiness. Until now, tradition had been the ultimate standard of what ought to be in Japan, but Itagaki introduced the Western appeal to natural rights and abstract concepts of justice, removed from circumstance and tradition. All over Japan, Shinjukus were established, schools that taught Western sciences and literature. Authors like John Stuart Mill, Herbert Spencer, and John Jacques Rousseau, and John Locke were at the top of reading lists. Fearful of these ideas spreading, the government attempted to censor the schools. However, demand was so high that the government could really do little to stop people's enthusiasm. Itagaki also established the self-help movement, named after the British author Samuel Smiles' book on how those born in poverty could succeed with perseverance. While this might sound a bit like pulling yourself up by the bootstraps talk, one has to remember Japanese people were used to their status being decided by birth, not merit. The self-help movement preached that birth had little to do with one's potential, a lesson embodied by men like Manjiro. Thanks to Itagaki, Tosa became known as the mecca of liberalism in Japan. Others followed Itagaki's example, starting their societies to push for the rights of people and elected legislature. The Meiji oligarchs feared that the spread of liberal ideas would lead to their downfall. In principle, they were not against everything that Itaki advocated for, they just wanted a very slow and gradual transition, one in which they ideally would hold on to all of their power and status. In 1875, government leaders met with Itagaki and other reformers, pledging to establish a constitutional monarchy and a legislative assembly. Itagaki rejoined the government as a councillor, but resigned quickly after. Despite all their talk, Itagaki saw that power was still concentrated in a small clique of elites. Realising that Itagaki would probably be impossible to placate, legislation was created that greatly restrained freedom of speech and association in an effort to strangle reform movements. But the real threat was not the reformers, but the old guard. Former samurai who had served in the Boshin War between the Emperor and Shogun felt betrayed by the Meiji government that they had fought to install. The Emperor promised to expel the barbarians, but now more than ever Western ideas were flourishing throughout Japan. All the while, samurai privileges were being restrained and abolished. Fearing they had become obsolete, in 1877, discontent samurai in Satsuma erupted into rebellion, leading to the name the Satsuma Rebellion. Under the reluctant leadership of Saigo Takamori, the samurai attempted to overthrow the Meiji government, but to no avail. By the end of the year, the rebellion had been defeated, with Saigo committing ritual suicide after his forces were defeated. Though an old friend of Saigo, Itagaki did not join this rebellion. When confronted by Saigo's followers, who asked why he didn't join them, he explained, Saigo fights the government with arms, we will fight them with the people's rights. Following the Satsuma Rebellion, the government further cracked down any form of dissent, attempting to choke any reform movements. But by 1881, it was apparent that Itagaki and his followers had no intention of being silenced. Realizing the need for reform, an edict was announced promising a national assembly would be inaugurated alongside a written constitution within 10 years. In response to the government's edict, Itagaki founded Japan's first ever political party, the Liberal Party. Itagaki stated that the purpose of the Liberal Party is to enjoy the nature-given happiness by propagating the truth of liberty, cultivating popular power, and limiting artificial power. In an essay entitled On Liberty, Itagaki explained why he pursued democratic government with such a passion. He explained that even a good government and just laws can suddenly degenerate into despotism and oppression. Good laws are not enough. An active and vigilant citizenry must check power. For Itagaki, public opinion is the axis around which government policy should revolve. But until very recently, Japan had no history of popular participation. To educate the people in democratic government and the role of a citizen, Itagaki began touring Japan, preaching his doctrine of limited and accountable government. He was met by large and enthusiastic crowds, but despite his popularity, some loathed the changes that he argued for, so much so that one disgruntled reactionary attempted to kill Itagaki during one of his speeches. 
Despite bleeding profusely, Itagaki shouted, Itagaki may die, but liberty will live. Thankfully, he did not die. And to the chagrin of his reactionaries, Itagaki may die, but liberty will live became a slogan of the popular rights movement. With a written constitution in the works, Itagaki decided to visit Europe to survey constitutional systems so he could figure out what would be the best for the people of Japan. Itagaki and the Liberal Party wanted a liberal monarchy based upon the English system, while the more conservative Meiji oligarchs pressed for a Prussian system with sovereignty located in the emperor. Though Itagaki was a radical in Japanese terms, he never dreamt of a Japanese government without some form of emperor. Explaining why he undertook this trip, Itagaki wrote, I had read a few books and heard about Western traditions, but only imagine what the situation of European countries might be, and the situation of Asia as it might be. He also admitted that his samurai upbringing during a period of isolationism meant that he had a limited imagination for alternative systems, and he needed to challenge himself. Itagaki set sail in the beginning of November in 1882 aboard a French steamship. En route to Europe, he stopped at Hong Kong, Saigon, Singapore, Sri Lanka, and Yemen. Though he set out on his voyage to admire Westerners, his stop in Asian countries made him aware of the widespread phenomenon of Western imperialism. He noticed that at home, Western countries preached about equality, and against the privileges of the nobility. But countries like England might be defenders of liberty at home. However, in Hong Kong, Singapore, and India, they destroyed liberty for the locals and monopolized positions of power, just like the government he had rebelled against. Summarizing European hypocrisy, Itagaki wrote, The people who advocate liberty and equality and boast of their civilization are the ones who arbitrarily impose their rights as lords, which they formerly disliked themselves and oppress Asian people. However, once Itagaki reached Marcel in France, he was amazed by his prosperity, concluding that he had arrived at the center of civilization. While in France, Itagaki met with the famous author, Victor Hugo, who wrote Les Miserables. Across the channel while visiting England, Itagaki met with the famous philosopher Herbert Spencer, who quickly became tired of Itagaki pontificating about his views, cutting their meeting short. Overall, Itagaki's trip to Europe actually diluted his liberal principles. Seeing firsthand the colonialism of European nations, Itagaki, like many other, advocated for a strong military force to repel any would-be colonists. Also, while abroad, the Liberal Party was significantly weakened by censorship and internal strife. Some theorized that Itagaki's trip was actually financed by the government to help collapse the Liberal Party. However, this was later proved to be false, but the damage was done. By 1884, the Liberal Party was dissolved due to internal strife. However, it was later revived in 1890 as the Constitutional Liberal Party. In 1889, the Meiji constitution was drafted, and though it was more akin to the Prussian than the English system, giving extensive power to the emperor, the freedom of people's rights movements under Itagaki's leadership had achieved what would have been considered politically impossible a single generation ago. A written constitution limiting the state's power by having standing rules, not the whims of government officials. Though the Liberal Constitutional Party remained as a force in Japanese politics, with their main goal of establishing a national assembly achieved, their energy kind of waned, in part also because of internal strife. In 1896 and 1889, Itagaki served in government as Home Minister, overseeing the administration of public works and elections. By the turn of the century, Itagaki was 63 years old and decided to retire from public life. He spent the rest of his days writing and discussing political issues until his death of natural causes in 1919. And though obscure today, Itagaki is featured on the Japanese 100 yen note as a tribute to his memory. It is a mistake to view the Meiji Restoration as a period of modernization in technology alone. Ideas advanced in tandem. Itagaki Tasuke was born into a strict feudal society ruled by a de facto military dictator. But by the end of his life, after decades of agitation, Japan was a constitutional monarchy, the first of its kind in East Asia. Through the public society of patriots, the Liberal Party and the self-help movement, Itagaki helped spread the ideas of John Stuart Mill, Herbert Spencer, John Jacques Rousseau, and John Locke. Western historians tend to view the Meiji Restoration as a kind of inevitable event determined by circumstance. But, as Joseph Pulitzer once warned, any event, once it has occurred, can be made to appear inevitable by any competent journalist or historian. The Meiji oligarchs opposed reform at every single turn, constantly kicking the can down the road promising gradual change. It is unlikely that without the gadfly Itagaki, the government would have ever fulfilled its promises for a reform government. The freedoms people earned, the rights they were protected, and the prosperity they experienced were not due to historical happenstance, but the efforts of men like Itagaki Tasuke, who broke a tradition and challenged unchecked political power, wherever it might lie. 
Thanks so much for listening. Portraits of Liberty is produced by Landry Aries and written by me, Paul Meany. If you like the show, make sure to review us on Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to see more content like this, check out the website libertarism.org.